Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, James, for the introduction. My name is Jose Ortiz. I work at Airbus, and together with my colleague, Volker Robrek, we're going to tell you today a little bit about what Airbus is doing in 3D printing technology. So just to make a short agenda, I'm more on the business part. I work five years for the retrofits. So I will make a short introduction about my company, in case you don't know it. And then Foca will get into the deep insight of the technology that we are currently using right now and the challenges we are facing. And then at the end, I will come back to you to show you some of the successful applications we already had uh, on Airbus. So let's start. So Airbus is an international company. We, it was formed some years ago joining the efforts of several nations. We are now an international company. We have to be innovative to break into the market, and we have to keep being innovative. So innovation, you saw it in the, in the, in the video, is one of our key values. And therefore, anytime we have a new, uh, a new technology, we jump into it. So as I always say, uh, we want to keep calm, but change the world. And that's why Airbus has been working since a long time on the 3D uh, printing technology. And I think this is something that you could be interested in. We have a vision. We always uh, look into the future. Uh, so to set us a, a goal to aim for, and we try to explore the current technologies to go with it. Therefore, I would like to share you a vision of our cabin for the future. Thank you. 
nice video, isn't it? So we may think this is too futuristic, this is too uh, science fiction, but it is not. Some of the technologies you have seen, we are currently exploring to them. In fact, from some of those technologies, we have customers who are uh, pushing us to develop them. Uh, and therefore, 3D printing is for us a key enabler for uh, being able to implement all these new features in the aircraft. But uh, we, have to be, we have to be back to the ground, back to the earth. Uh, the aerospace industry has safety on the very top. And therefore, making any change uh, on the aerospace industry, it's quite hard. So as I always said, we want to change the world while being calm. So just make steps forward, but not rush into them because we could make mistakes. And therefore, to make things fly, uh, we have experts at Airbus, like Volker, my colleague, who will tell you who we are right now and what are the challenges we are now facing. Volker? Thank you, Rosé. Many thanks. So this was a view from a Spanish um, manager. Yeah? So and uh, my job is basically the implementation of the technology. So that means I'm suffering always the requests on being so innovative, bringing all the nice ideas into the aircraft, and I'm, then I'm suffering with the um, safety topics and for sure with the business case. Huh? But um, let's see how the uh, reality is. It's not so bad. And uh, I will give you a short introduction where we are and what are our um, next steps are. Um, so why are we looking for, um, for additive? Huh? Um, so clearly, we are looking for cost, huh? so, which is not so obvious, basically. Huh? So the technology is extremely um, cost intensive. So that means uh, when we are looking for serial um, aircraft, commercial aircraft production, it's not obvious that we're going with this technology. Huh? So that means we have a few um, very good applications, so which are dedicated to small amounts, small quantities. So, for example, we are very active in the after-sales business, spares and also the, um, the retrofit uh, activities. And secondly, everything on a serial application. We're looking also for applications where we usually have uh, high non-recurrent costs. So, basically, toolings and all those kind of things. Huh? So, and these are the niches where we are good in. And the rest is still um, quite cost-intensive as a technology. Agility is very important as well, so mainly during development phase of new aircrafts and also for the ramp up, the ramp up phase of production. Yeah, so where we usually suffering uh, of missing parts and all those kind of things and there is a techno brick is uh, definitely 3D printing here. Product performance, basically we are looking to two effects. So one is uh, just simply uh, weight, yeah? so reduced weight by a topology optimized design. Uh, so, and um, uh, secondly, function integration. Yeah. So what are our ways to introduce? So clearly we're going the uh, safe and also the easy way. Yeah. So that means we start with non-critical parts and then we're going to more uh, more critical parts. We're using existing materials and on the same way we're approaching for new materials and try to test them and to be on the safe side there as well. We start as well with ESO design and then we're going to design for manufacturing. So also this is not so obvious, but we need to do it for safety reasons. Huh? So we always have to um, uh, compare our new technologies with the as-is status, even when we know that it's not optimized for a new technology. Uh, but it's a clear must, and it's for us uh, very important to do so. Then the next step is that we are implementing parts into running programs. Yeah? So that means it does not have to be always a big quantity, but it has to be that we implement as soon as possible parts just to be ready also for new developments and new programs uh, to, uh, to have a good uh, fundament to discuss with the airworthiness and all the, uh, all the authorities. Just to say, okay, so we're having parts implemented since 10 years, so we know the risk, so we are fine with this, and then we can proceed. How are we going to approach it internally? So for sure we want to understand the technology on ourselves. Uh, so this is nothing what, what we go and to see on the, uh, just simply on the supply market and then uh, uh, leaving all the suppliers alone. We want to understand it and we have to assess all the risk on the technology. We have to understand what kind of technical risk, what kind of economical risk, and as well a third important aspect is um, the productivity. Yeah. So we have to ensure that all the uh, supply chain is able to deliver the parts on time. Yeah. And then the second step is for sure to do the same exercise with the uh, uh, supply chain. Huh? 
So we internally have access to a lot of printers for different materials, but for sure the suppliers or the supply landscape has also different printers where the reality is always a little bit different. So we are basically having um, metal applications as well as polymer applications. On metal side, for sure we are looking for the classical powder bed technology, so mainly we are looking for titanium as well as inconel. Uh, and then on, as a second technology, we are looking for the direct energy depositioning. So we are um, looking mainly on the filament technology. But today I don't want to speak too much about metal, so I want to speak a little bit more on the polymer side. So on the polymer side, for sure, we are using the filament technology, which is mainly uh, with the Stratasys um, printers, and also with the classical powder bed technology, like the selective laser sintering. Yeah? So I'm not focusing too much here on the binder technology, so we clearly have an eye on this, but we do not have appropriate material right now for our applications, so that means I will focus here on, the, uh, on these two uh, well-known uh, technologies. So why are um, polymers interesting for us? Clearly one big, big um, uh, application what we see is highly customized cabin applications. Business and first class, yeah, so we sometimes have only a few uh, aircrafts where we have an adapted, um, uh, highly configured uh, aircraft, especially in the business and first class. We have always a door entrance area, which is very special to a customer, and for sure everything what is uh, in the after-sale uh, reconfigurations. Yeah. So this is definitely a field which we want to develop and where we are not sufficiently uh, set up so far. Where we are already quite good is in terms of the system installation applications, so we have good applications in terms of um, uh, systems which are more um, environmental control, so air conditioning, by the way, uh, so, uh, and also systems insulation. Uh, so we have implemented really a lot of brackets, brackets for electrical harnesses and also for, for tubes and pipes. Um, also, the reason is, is I think, quite simple. Huh? So the, uh, the applications of brackets and so on, so is, I would say, relatively easy because we have to... Um, to deal only with the uh, certification rules, we have to deal with all the uh, loads, mechanical properties, and so on. But the visual aspects is a clearly uh, other level of requirements. Huh? So this is something what every customer of us, every airline, and every passenger ju just see. And this is where we have really, really high, uh, high um, requirements on it. So when we look down to what we um, fields where we have to focus on, so clearly the process, huh? so printing process, when we want to establish the, um, the cabin, uh, cabin field of application, we need also in the raw material process already a best surface quality. Because at the end, the parts, they get some kind of filler on top of it and then also some kind of paint. And when we, for example, start with the filament technology, we have to apply a lot of this kind of fillers. So first, it's a lot of work, just simply um, sometimes manual work and sometimes it's uh, going semi-automated. And in addition, uh, this kind of material burns quite good. Huh? So this is not our intention, so we definitely have to limit it uh, uh, to the best way we can. So therefore, especially for the cabin application, we are looking a little bit more for the powder bed um, technology where the resolution uh, uh, for the process is, um, is advanced. Industrial readiness is also a very important uh, point. We always have to keep in mind that the parts what we right now implement into the aircraft, we want to reproduce them even in 10, 20, and 30 years, like this. So that means also the, uh, all the defects and so on, what we have uh, by nature out of the uh, process, they have to be repeatable and does not have to cost us too much quality work as well. Yeah? So this is always very, very tricky. Yeah? So and this is a major step what we have to go from, uh, from prototyping business to serial applications. Build size, for sure, I think this is quite clear. What comes more and more in, uh, in our view is the environmental friendliness. Huh? So that can include also um, um, a business for recyclability of the, of the parts. Huh? So everything what is going to scrap and so on, so is belonging to this, uh, to this perimeter. So material for sure. So one prerequisite to uh, have um, material implemented into our aircrafts are flame, smoke, and toxicity requirements. Huh? So basically, uh, 
we, are can, we can only use the material which is flame retardant. So then on top, there come a, a special requirement uh, called heat release for cabin application. Basically, it's the amount of heat which will be deflected in terms of a fire event to the passengers. It just simply should avoid the passengers to get too much panic when there is a fire. So there is uh, always a, a limit of this. And we have to fulfill these kind of requirements uh, with all the paint. Uh, so that means it's not sufficient to have it only for the raw material. We have to do it with the uh, combination. Mechanical strength, for sure this is clear, and uh, also low aging effects. Uh, so a lot of materials what we have are quite brittle. And when we want to have the parts as, as they are 30 years later still in the aircraft, we have to ensure that they will not break just simply because of deflection. What we're looking for sure is also the end-to-end -end process chain. No? So um, there are um, some needs in terms of pre-processing software. Um, so that means includes nesting, uh, nesting topics. It includes also the optimization in terms of cost. We see a lot of software which is focusing on uh, topology optimization, but only on, on stress side. Yeah? So we can, uh, we can do a very lightweight design, but they does not have to be necessarily uh, um, cheap. Sometimes they are, they are much more expensive than we uh, want to have it. But this is already ongoing. I think this is uh, understood from the main software suppliers. Uh, so let's see when we can implement it. Design principle is very simple, how to design parts for, for additive. Huh? Then the printing process, what I already mentioned, and then also the post-processing. This can include, for example, for the, uh, especially for the Kaplan application, the surface smoothening. So when we see all these kind of fields, what are we going to approach in terms of uh, 3D printing for cabin applications? So first, we're looking for an own uh, developed technology, which is called Thermomelt. For this one, we are, uh, we are using basically a powder bed technology, so a variation of the powder bed technology, and we are uh, using PEC material. PEC material because it is flame retardant by nature, so it has very good mechanical properties, and for sure also the media resistance is excellent. The drawback is always it's quite uh, expensive. Huh? The, the technology so far is still in the R&D phase, yeah? and um, is progressing quite, uh, quite good. Nevertheless, we are looking always also for the market. Huh? So that means uh, we're looking for powder bed technology in addition with uh, appropriate material. It can be polyamide 6 and it can be also uh, PEG materials. Huh? So this is where we are looking right now. So PA6 is usually also very, um, um, very frequently used within our applications. And it's the advantage of the PA6 uh, with respect to PEC is always uh, the, uh, uh, the cost. So it's just simply much more cheap. So with the PEC, we can uh, look for cabin applications. We can look also for some special applications in the serial applications. But the big amount will still remain in the, maybe in the area where we can use um, PA6. So where we are strong or where we are having a, a lot of quantity of parts implemented, sh clearly we are looking for the filament and also for the powder bed technology. Yeah? So when we compare these, um, uh, these technologies together with also the PEC thermomelt uh, technology where we are in the development, we see that the, um, the FLM technology is very good in size. So I do not, I mean, we always have parts which are bigger, but I think it's a reasonable size. Surface roughness is usually not sufficient for our Kaplan application. So mechanical strength, so it's anisotrop, yeah, so which makes our life as, uh, as engineers a little bit more complicated. Nevertheless, we have uh, definitely good applications for it. Huh? Uh, and the target what we, um, what we, uh, where we implement this is basically system attachments brackets. So for the uh, polyamide 12 with the SLS technology, so also there the size is, I would say, relatively reasonable for the applications what we're doing. Surface roughness is the best what we um, have so far as a raw material. So the material is isotrop. The mechanical properties are a little bit, I would say, when we compare it to the rest, a little bit weak, but it's a polyamide 12, so it's clear. So we have this also implemented in our Beluga program, which is our internal um, transportation aircraft. And we are using it there for pipes and also brackets as well. So when we're now going 
to the, uh, to the packed thermal melt. So still the size is, uh, is a weakness, but it's clear because we are just starting. Huh? So always we start with a small size and then we uh, want to extend it to a bigger size. Surface roughness is comparable to the, uh, to the rest of the powder bed technology, so it's very good. Uh, mechanical strength is, as a pack material, very good. And also it's uh, isotropic, so which is a huge advantage. Uh, and this is definitely the technology what we want to approach for cabin applications. So where are we right now? So for the filament technology, we have implemented right now more than 50,000 parts in, uh, in, all, um, in all programs. Yeah, so this is a total sum. The majority is in the A350 implemented. We have it as well in the fly test, we have it as well in the spares, and we have it also in the upgrade services, including um, a few um, niche but very good uh, uh, cabin applications. We have the SLS technology, which we mainly have on the Beluga aircraft, where we have, um, I would say, per, um, uh, per, um, per aircraft, maybe 150 parts flying. Yeah. And then we have the thermal melt, where the development is still, still ongoing. So when we see the big amount of filament technology parts, so Jose will explain you a little bit um, uh, very um, good applications what we have done with respect to um, cabin upgrades. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. Thank you, Volker. So as Volker was saying, we have currently 50,000 parts done by, with Thermomelt, uh, sorry, with Ultim uh, flying, but most of them, I would say all of them, uh, but two or three, are not visible, are not cabin parts. As he was mentioning before, we have a huge uh, challenge when trying to put things into the cabin because of the flammability, smoke, toxicity, and heat release. So I work um, five years uh, on the after sales uh, department of Airbus, working directly with customers. So I was the, the, the face to the customer. And they were pushing us for quick solutions. We definitely you think, OK, we could use 3D printed technology. And then we start facing all, all these problems that I mentioned before. I want to show you a couple of uh, applications where we think it may already uh, be worth going for this technology. So this is a, um, a real example. There was a retrofit, that means a retrofit. You're flying uh, with your aircraft as an airline, and after five years, you decide to change the, the cabin. So you plan um, a layover somewhere where you, where you ground the aircraft for two weeks, and then you reshape your, your cabin. So everything is set up on advance, everything is scheduled on advance. Uh, you ship a kit, which is a big box with everything inside that you need to do the, to do the, the reconfiguration. We call it the walking party. And that was a Chinese customer. And when you arrive there, you, have, uh, you want to put in this yellow part that you see over there. Hmm? And then when you open the box, you find this big part over there, which, of course, doesn't fit into the, into the hole that you have. Hmm? And you have two weeks to solve the problems. Otherwise, the aircraft cannot be released back to the air, to, to service, and for every single day that the aircraft is not being released back to service, Airbus has to pay, and that's a lot of money. So we solved the problem because we were lucky, and what we did, and it's a law by the way, we saw the part, and we make a temporary adaptation. So we, we were able to release the aircraft back into service on time, with, uh, with, let's say, uh, an exception, it's called temporary adaptation, where you can fly two years until you replace the, the part with the original one, the real, the real one. But what could have happened if it was the other way around? We have a big hole and a small part. We should have a big, a big problem. So this is one of the key points uh, for us for, for after sales at Airbus, is lead time, lead time, lead time, lead time. So every day that an aircraft is grounded, it costs a lot of money, and therefore, uh, manufacturing costs that uh, do not uh, play a role that day. This is also a real example. That was um, uh, an F-20, a European customer. The walking party was planned in five weeks. And I repeat, five weeks before the walking party, the supplier called us and tell us, I'm not able to deliver the kit. I will deliver everything but this part. This part is the part that goes uh, above your head. So, and of course, as you imagine, you can't release an aircraft back to, the, back to service with a hole there. 
you see the cables, you see everything. So what we did, uh, we contact one of our, uh, our uh, partners, uh, Materialize, and we, we did also a temporary adaptation because at the moment the process was not established, fully established, and we, within five weeks, I repeat, within five weeks, uh, with the help of Materialize, we did that great work and we print that with, uh, with Ultem. Of course, temporary adaptations, only two years, but we saved the, we saved the problem. So late changes, adaptation on spot is also an application. What else? Um, that's it. So we have some lessors. Lessors is, uh, lessors is a kind of a very specific customer. He owns the aircraft, but he leases it to, the, to, a, to an airline. And when the lease ended, they, they move it from one airline to the other one. So they have to do a very, very, uh, um, very fast change. Sometimes cabin reconfiguration. So when they ask us, can you please do in six months the cabin reconfiguration? And then we say, yes, we can do it, but we have to ask our suppliers if they are able to deliver within this uh, time frame. And sometimes the, the supplier say, I can't deliver it, but in nine months. And then the lessor say, wait, but I have to do the switch in six months. You make it in six months or you, we, we go somewhere else. And we have uh, lost some deals because we could not be, our suppliers were not able to deliver on time. And for this kind of applications, we think that 3D printing technology could be a, a very nice way to explore lithium. Another applications, I don't want to go too much into details, we're running a lot of time, but uh, if we have small batches, if you're doing just three, four, five pieces, it's not a serial application, it's just for a carbon recuperation, maybe a, a repair, whatever, it makes worth going into this direction. And also, um, as we, we saw before, we have a vision, we are we're moving into the, into the future, we know for sure that with the traditional production methods, we will not be able to fulfill our vision. Therefore, we have to think out of the box, achieve the achievable, prepare ourselves for the future, and start moving now and do it. So, I'm going to go to, the, to these um, uh, three examples uh, where they are flying. This is a, a piece, um, uh, the tail picture of the space that you have over, above your head when you put your luggage, right? You have an aluminum profile, and then you have a, you have a piece of, uh, of plastic which is, which is below. So when the aircraft were made 20 years ago, they were not supposed, or people were not supposed to, each of one to have a trolley with you in the cabin and to put it over. Therefore, they are not uh, thought for that, and people today, they are sometimes not so gentle with the luggage. So at some point, this plastic uh, part goes out of the aluminum uh, profile, and then the cabin crew, after the flight, just push it back. And at some point, you break it. So we have a relay and we say, we need a solution for that, because it, looks, it doesn't look nice. It looks like the aircraft is old, or is, or is it, it's not uh, properly maintained, which is not the case. It's just a visual, visual thing, but we want to change it. So we did, we did a, a 3D printing part. This is, by the way, not painted, so in reality it looks much nicer, but it solves the problem. So that's a way of, of improving things. Another point is I mentioned before, we, we, we save the, the working party. So speed, five weeks before not being noticed to being able to release the uh, aircraft back to the service. This is the part, I will have some slides on that. This is a spacer. This is a very nice part. I have it also here for you afterwards. You can have a look. I have two slides about that. Uh, but we, we did some nice design with materialize and we save also some weight. So, one, go to, I don't want to go too much into details, but we save a lot of money be, uh, with this part because it's a small budget. We have only to print five or six of them. Therefore, uh, it makes sense to go like this. So, I'm going to call you a little bit more about, tell you a bit more about the bionic spacer. This is the part I have here. So, um, as mentioned before by Folka, we have a very, very bad time trying to put things into the cabin because of the flammability, heat release, and toxicity re requirements. So we said, okay, let's take, a, let's take an example with a real customer, a, a part which will be flying, and let's push ourselves through our own system. Airbus is a big company, there's a lot of stakeholders, and it's really difficult sometimes to make changes. Nevertheless, there's always nice and, and uh, motivated people like Folka uh, who help us really pushing forward. So what we did is the following. We want to change, we want to, to, to push the envelope, our envelope. <clears throat> so what we did is uh, we look at the retrofit campaign we were having on, and we select uh, a customer and an application which we think it will be interesting for exploring the new ideas. 
So this is a part of the NFT20 on the rear part. And this is what we call overhead storage compartment spacer. It's a very long word. It's just the part that you have there. You see there? You can put it like this. So you see the traditional one. Uh, that was there. At the time we signed the contract with the customer, we were not sure that the traditional supplier would deliver on time. And therefore, we contact our colleague from Matea and say, we have, a, we have an opportunity here. We will take it as a chance. And we will push ourselves through the system. So what we did was the following. We designed with some bionic uh, structures. You can ask Volker something about that. After that, we saved 15% uh, weight. We could have been even more aggressive, but we wanted to have it first right. So we, we didn't push that much. Nevertheless, 15% less, which is always good on aerospace um, industry. We produce it and test it. It withstands five times more than it's supposed to withstand with. So we were more uh, than conservative. Uh, we had the surface treatment, which was really, really a hard time. And I want to, again, thank Materialize because of the hard work, because it was very, very difficult to fulfill all the worth in a requirement, plus the Airbus trim and finish requirements, which our customers will always stick to it. We produce it, we certify it, and it's flying. This is uh, a picture of the working party. Uh, where you see where the, where the, the part is installed. Unfortunately, when you fly with the customer, you will not realize that it's a cool 3D printed bionic design because everything is not visible. Nevertheless, we know it and we're happy about it. That's it for my side. Um, Volker, you want to go through some conclusions? Yes, thank you, Jose. So I will give um, the conclusion. So we are active on the polymer side, um, so uh, with, the, uh, with the technology of filament and also the powder, um, powder technology. So there we implemented really a lot of parts already in serial uh, applications. What we do right now, so we replace mainly um, existing geometries, existing parts, and then we are approaching for, um, for new uh, applications and new designs. So we have good applications in the after-sale market, including cabin. But again, it's a niche so far because the effort is really, really high with the technology what we have right now. So we have a relatively stable and good supply chain established. So I think this is completely uncritical. But what our, still our main challenges are cost, cost, cost. This is clear. It's still a very expensive technology. The quality, so which is always a big effort afterwards, including the post process. The size, so bigger parts we have to assemble later on. Repeatability, and these are the main uh, technical challenges what we are facing. Um, so what is our outlook? When we want to, to really realize cabin applications, and I'm totally convinced that there is a big market for us, is we have to go for the, uh, for the powder bed technology more and more with appropriate materials. So that means we are looking for the uh, uh, internal uh, development of the thermal melt process and for sure we're looking also with all suppliers with all existing technologies uh, including uh, materials what is on the market so that's it from our side so many thanks uh, for your um, uh, for your listening I'm not so sure if we still have some time for questions in case if not uh, we will be all the time around here so you can always contact us uh, in a face-to-face -face discussion. And by the way, by the way, you can see this pacer at the materialized booth, so you can have a look anytime. Many thanks. Thank you.